So the methodology itself, um, um, I based it around LODs, um, and, and they're not strictly correct, uh, because what we find is um, different disciplines are at different levels of development at the same time on a project. Um, for instance, uh, when we're heading towards as construction, we're actually letting contracts on the structure while the architectural model is still being developed along further. So you actually find in that instance the structural model is ahead of uh, the architectural model in, 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 its, in its development. Um, the idea of the arrow is we know very little in the beginning, we know lots at the end. What we need to do from a QS point of view is make those big decisions when we know very little, and at the end, you're making little tic tac sort of decisions that are fine-tuning type things. The concept stage, the type, what we do in a, a traditional workflow, and this is unchanged, we estimate um, elementally. Um, if there is a model available, um, we'll pull mass information from that model. It might be a Revit massing model. If it's sketch up, we won't get any information. We get geometry, though. Um, at the next phase, schematic design, we're still estimating elementally. Um, but now we're starting to look at things like, well, a facade is so much cost, a roof is so much cost, that style of thing. It's not like we're putting a flat rate on the whole, on the whole area of the building. Um, we're pulling general, info, general assembly information from the model, and in terms of what we can push back, we can push back um, elemental codes if they're valuable at that time. The same as work breakdown structures, but they may not be valuable at that time. When we get to DD, we're then estimating at sub-elemental level. So while um, uh, at um, schematic design we might have a rate on substructure or we might have a rate on the ground slab and then piled foundations, at this time we're now starting to say, well, there's so many cubic metres of concrete in pad footings. There's so many tonnes of reinforcement, that type of thing. Um, and we're rating it up. We're pulling, we're pulling specific assembly information from the model and we start to push back again sub-elemental codes if they're valuable. At the end, and this is something that I heard it talked about earlier today, that if you record the actual costs at construction, well then that's what you've got, uh, that's what's useful for FM. That's actually not true. Now the reason for that is there's a number of different figures that are required for FM. Um, so one thing they're interested in is the replacement cost of something to insure it. Now, if you dig a hole, you don't insure a hole. Um, if you demolish something and it doesn't exist anymore, you don't then insure it later. So it's about filtering the costs and deciding what needs to be kept and what needs to be used. Um, they, they use different figures for different things as well. So um, if you're doing a, a, a maintenance budget, um, it will be looking at the expected life or the, the life that the manufacturer says this thing will live for as compared to if you're looking at a depreciated cost, the tax office tells us what those lives are. So you end up with different information that needs to go into there. In terms of the things that we do in these different phases, the initial one is about working the concept, it's about making the building more efficient and I'll give you an example of that. Within 200 to 300, it's the commencement of the living cost plan. The reason why it starts there is because that's about when the model gets fixed. Um, the, thing, the types of tools we use then are cost benchmarking, that sort of thing. You start to look at alternatives and structure, um, and we can do that through revisioning. When we move beyond 300 and we're starting to set up for um, construction, getting ready for construction, um, it's the first time that we do things like quantity takeoff. Um, we, start, we can prepare trade packages, they can be done in Australian standard method format if that's what's required. These sorts of things weren't believed to be possible only um, sort of five years ago. When we head to construction, so once, we're, once we're, we're underway, we basically pull out the estimating rates and you put in the contract rates. When we've got the contract rates in there, you can start to um, uh, value variations and those types of things when models change. So they're the types of tasks that are done. A couple of examples. Um, working the concept, this is an apartment building that was uh, in Brisbane, um, 286, 286 units. The turnout cost was 56 million. Basically what we track is what the area is per unit. So we're not interested in the different types of units. We want to know what the average area per unit is. Um, and then we want to know what the saleable area is because that's what makes the money. Um, and that's how the value is valued. So here we're building 110 square metres of building and we're selling 60 
six. Um, that 110 doesn't include balconies. Balconies are actually something that makes money. So you start to look at the efficiency of the building. We compare that to its competing apartment projects in that market. So we don't want like design, we want to look at what's being sold for the same amount of money um, and for that same sort of quality. And it looks pretty good. 110 square metres, we're inside it, but it is too small. Um, but here's a key one, that common area, 28 square metres versus 15.5. So at that early phase, if I give that one direction, we'll save $6 million on the project. Now to save $6 million on a project when you're at tender, 10% is really, really hard. Because you're left with things like floor coverings and tiles and tapware and yada yada, and you just won't get there. You'll usually sort of save 2 or 3% unless you delete whole sections of work. So that's one example. Basically you have a lot of those happening at the same time you start to get a more efficient building. Um, but it still keeps its design in there, its design intent. Log 200 is about benchmarking. This is the same project, so we're costing it up. It's working out to $2,067 a square metre. This is quantity surveying speak, or QSID. Um, basically, we, we record every cost um, on every project we work on in this way. These are t tendered costs, so we're comparing what this one's estimating at to what has been recently tendered in the market, and we find that this one's too high. But by looking at the elements, it's pretty simple. There's only two areas. It's the structure and the plumbing that needs to be looked at. So the QS role is not so much about quantity takeoff. It's more about identifying where we can make some improvements. The transparency comes in because we might decide, well, we want to spend that money on plumbing. Um, so these decisions are made along the way. The living cost plan, um, <coughs> the way it works... And this is some work that we did with CSI. Um, a complicated hospital, it was 56 models, um, but revisioning between one model to the other um, and then produce a report. Um, so this is, how, this is how the information looked on, on that building. Um, and it gets very, very precise. So you're able to indicate every quantity for every item and how it's changed. And while it's not a bill of quantities, it looks an awful lot like one. Um, and many people, uh, uh, yeah, they, they wouldn't tell the difference. This, these descriptions are all driven from the model. We haven't added anything to it. We've added a couple of little words to make punctuation and stuff like that within the map. But really, we've just taken information from different places in the model and assembled it in a way that it, it makes sense. Um, when we're looking at alternative designs, um, this, it, it, it gives a level of precision. So value management is often driven around a, a um, shopping list. The old school way was you give a shopping list to a QS or to the builder, put some figures on it, it goes, oh, we'll never save that amount, and you start stripping out money. So it might actually work it out to 250000 but not convinced that the design will reflect that, so I reported it at two hundred. The problem with that is often people look at it and they go, well, if we're only going to save that amount of money, I think I want to keep it. Um, where, where transparency comes into this is you start to get precision about every saving on every meterage of the, of the, of the, uh, the balustrade, of the hob, of the tiles, all the components that have been deleted in there and it's picked up. It gets around this problem with contractors where they say, you've, you've reduced the area of the building, and he says, oh, but you reduce the living area. You know, those expensive bits, the kitchen and the, and the bathroom are still there, so I can't give you back all the money. So this is where you start to get transparency in these things in terms of negotiations. Alternative materials are done in the same way. This is just looking at different cladding. Um, this one had um, actually different, uh, different spans on the cladding, so you ended up with wall girts in different places. Um, another thing that we can work with, this is work that we did with uh, ADG. Um, I mean, Vico earlier was saying they've got the only piece of software um, that combines 4D and 5D together in the world, and that is true. Because to do this is really, really hard. Um, the reason that this is hard is because time and cost just don't sit well together. Um, in cost, we, we cost it by uh, the quantity of material, whereas on time, you'll tend to look at, say, a slab for a, uh, for a tower, you're working on a cycle, and it's more like this thing's going to be done in five days, and that's the cycle that we need to meet, and we'll work out the manpower to make it happen. It's not driven, the costings aren't driven, or the time period isn't driven by quantities in the same way. 
Um, but this is a demo of the work that we did with ADG. Um, and, and it was hard to do because basically what we needed to do was export the activity codes from P6, ADG pushed them into the model, then we pulled them out of the model, attached our costings to them, um, then put it into another database where we mixed it together and then we looked at it in Navis. And if it wasn't right, well, then you had to do it all again. So while revisioning within Costex is very, very simple, revisioning in this is hard. Um, but things like Vico look like they're, um, they're doing that in a much better way. So the work that we actually did... Um, or the, the work that we did was on a, on a Log 400 model. So we're doing it for a subcontractor, um, and we were uh, looking at his general ledger at the cost he'd incurred on the job, and then we were projecting forward on what his cost to complete was to work out what his margin was going to be. Um, and that is extremely valuable. We were doing that one month to another. But this sort of stuff where you're looking at sort of cash flow, um, um, while this is precise... I'm not certain that will bring the value that people think it will bring. Um, where this really comes into play is when you start looking at what the actual costs are on the project, and that will come from the people that own the costs. What is simple with Navis is to be able to just put some costs in there and stretch it over a period so it looks like it's calculating it, it um, properly, but in, actual, in actuality it's not. Another example, I talked earlier about contract admin. So something that's a no-brainer is um, when we're uh, working on designs and, uh, and we, we tend not to model reinforcement, but something that has extreme value to a contractor is modeling reinforcement. And I think every contractor should pay to have um, a reinforcement model. And the reason is is because you can, you can keep entirely up to date as to what, what the how those quantities are going and what those costs are. Um, what occur the way things are done at, at, in, the, in the current format is basically there's some design tonnages per cubic metre that are used to base the budgets. Um, the supplier brings the steel and he bills for it along the way and you don't find out you've got to blow out until the end. Um, you can do some cross-checks on elements along the way but invariably it gets left at the end. So nobody cares about it along the way, but at the end, everyone wants to know about it because there's usually a significant loss there. Um, now, the next step is then, well, we'll get someone to remeasure it. Um, and that will generally be within a construction office. It'll be the cadet um, that gets that job because it's a bugger of the job. Whereas if it's modelled, if a bit of money is spent in creating the models at the outset, these costs can be um, tracked extremely closely. This project itself was 1,000 tonnes in one wall. Um, and uh, ADG modelled this as well. And, I mean, there's just these couple of bars that were added in green that across the building, uh, across the structure, added in 15.5 tonnes. Now, in the overall scheme of it, that money wasn't very much. But these things are happening with every revision that goes through. So it gives, it gives a, a good way of tracking it. <laughs> 